And uh, as they're making their way out, if you would please take your Bibles and open to the book of Luke. Luke chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8. Let me once again encourage you to, uh, during the new year, in whatever manner it is, that you plan on setting some type of goal, uh, whether, it's, whether it's something, but, but something that you will do every day. The reason being is, is this, not so much that uh, you can get something accomplished, that's a, that is a positive and that would be a good end result, but sometimes setting those goals are just to keep you and I in check to answer to ourselves and not let circumstances and other things uh, dictate how we live. In other words, you, you and I need to make sure that we're in control of who we are and what we do, our appetites and things of that nature. So even if it's something that, you know what, Lord, every single day, the first thing that I do when I wake up, I'm going to, I, I'm going to read a verse, I'm going to say a prayer, and then every single day you do that. And then the day that you wake up and you start doing something outside of that, say, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I messed up, and then do it then. But in that instance, you and I need to make sure that we keep accountability to ourselves. You need to be telling yourself what to do, not just letting everything that happens around you dictate what takes place. So in that instance, set a goal this year that you can fulfill. But set a goal that's simple enough that every single day you can do it, whether it's I'm going to take my, my vitamins every single day. Or whether it's, uh, you know what would be interesting, and, and I, might, uh, I might ask Miss Kim if she would consider doing something along those lines, to just on a three by five, if there are three simple exercises that you can do every day. It doesn't have to be anything to, I'm not talking about, you know, 15 cartwheels. I'm not talking like that. I'm saying, you know, uh, you know just whatever the case may be, whether it's, a, a, whether it's a stretching, whether it's just moving, or whether it's a squat, or whatever the case may be, but something that you do every single day. You say, well, that's not easy. I know it's not easy. That's why you set the goal to do it. It's to accomplish something and tell yourself, I can do this. <laughs> I know that sometimes we tell ourselves we can do things like going downstairs and it changes things when that happens, right, Ms. Carmen? And, uh, but, uh, you know, we tell ourselves, oh, I can do this. And the next thing it's like, oh, should have done that. I know there's, there's things like that that happen. Now, me, I'm setting a goal to see how much I can eat this year. And so, but, uh, uh, but in that instance, whatever the case may be, just try to set a goal and then do it consistently. And like I said, you set a goal that's simple enough every single day, whether it's just, Lord, I'm going to pray for one missionary on the missions list every single day, and then do it. And uh, in that instance, that's something that you can do. That's something that's achievable. That's something that you can acquire. But you will accomplish things, and you'll keep yourself in check. And, uh, and so in that instance, it reminds us that uh, we need to make sure to, to set those goals. But Luke chapter number 8, we're going to read verses 5 through 15 this morning. It uh, sounds like a number of verses, a familiar passage, but the truth is there's something here that I think we need to take note of. As the new year comes upon us, that means that there's going to be some things that we are doing. And in the process of doing them, we need to make sure that we accomplish the goal that is set before us in the fact of making a positive impact not only on our lives, but on our community and on our world. And as simple as it sounds, one person can make a big difference. Jesus, when uh, in the scripture he reminds us, uh, it says, I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap. God says, I'm looking for one. So in that instance, you said he, he wasn't looking for thousands, he was looking for one. And in that instance, you can be the one that the Lord is looking for if you would make yourselves available. And so in that instance, we see here that there is something that is being done that I think all of us, whether we realize it or not, are participating in. And, it's, and it's, uh, it's basically let out a little bit here in these verses, and we want to look at that this morning. So if you found Luke chapter number 8, we read these verses responsibly. Could we stand for the reading of God's word? I'll read the first verse if you'll join me on the next, and we'll read down through verse number 15 this morning. Luke chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 5, the Bible says, A sower went out to sow his seed. 
And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up, and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fall among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on a good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit, with patience. I want you to notice, if you would please, the beginning of the entire thing starts in verse number five where it says, a sower went out to sow his seed. Seeing that's the case, we see here that the man had determined that he's going to try to have a harvest of some sort. Whether that is the purpose behind everything, we can't dic dictate, nor can, can we know exactly where the seed's going to fall. Scripture tells us. But there's one thing that we're still required to do. A sower went out to sow. So I want to talk to you this morning about the seeds, the seeds. Father, I do ask that you'd please help us this morning to see the importance and the impact that we can make on our world. And I ask that you'd please just bless today. Thank you again for all that you do. And we ask now for your help in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. The very first verse gives us the intent of what the entire passage is, is speaking about. You see, a, a sower went out to sow. I like the way that it's stated. It just didn't say a random individual. This is somebody, a sower. That meant that he had a purpose in mind. It wasn't just happenstance, and it wasn't just, well, I think I'll do something today. This fellow realized what I'm going to do is my job is to sow seed. I, ca I can't dictate where all the seed are going to fall. Now, today, of course, in uh, our farming practice practices, uh, the fellows, when they get out into the field, they begin to prepare the ground and, and plan on where it's going to go, and they pretty much can dictate where everything uh, is planted and how everything is placed and how everything is going to... But when it all boils down, there is still a little bit of, all I can do is do my part, I have to leave the rest to God. I can't, I can't make the seed germinate. I can't make the seed produce. I can't make those things happen. I've got to leave that up to God. And so in that instance, we begin to try to, the fellows, they, they work hard on pr preparing the ground. They work hard on making sure they have good seed. They make sure that they, but in that instance, there is still an element where God has to be involved with all of it. The truth is, the Bible reminds us that God provides and he, it rains on the just and the unjust. So whether a man goes out and he plants the seed and uh, says, Lord, I ask that you'd please help this to grow and help it to be uh, productive. And I ask that you'd please help the prices to be set where it's going to be uh, a productive harvest. And it doesn't matter whether he goes out and he's cursing and swearing the whole thing when he plants. Chances are it's still going to grow. That is a lesson that all of us need to understand is this. We are sowing every day. Everyone is sowing something every single day. Whether you know it or not, there is a, uh, a law of sowing and reaping. As I've stated before, it's just as real as a law of gravity. It's not going to change. A lot of folks uh, call it, uh, well, it's karma. or what? Well, not miss karma. It's, uh, you know, it's what goes around comes around. Keep this in mind. This, is, this has been uh, uh, an element that God has put into practice ever since the dawn of creation. What you sow, you're going to reap. And in that instance, he reminds us that, therefore, you must consider that every single day you are sowing whether you believe it or not. That means that you must be careful on a regular basis how you are dealing with your daily life. Because what you sow, you're going to reap. 
It's the law of the harvest. It, it's just, it, it is just as real as, as I said, the law of gravity. Now, you can try to defy it. You can say you don't believe it, but it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. You jump off this building, it's not the fall that's the problem. It's that sudden stop at the end that's the difficulty. It's going to happen. And what you sow in a day's time is going to come back in some manner. Oftentimes it does not, and here's, here's the law, what you sow, you will reap. There it is, in Bible, the, even scripture tells us that, but we know that. You see, what we do is we, we sow a bunch of, of sorry seeds and then we, play for, we, we pray for a, 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 a harvest failure. Lord, please don't let that come back and get me. Well, maybe you should have thought about that before you planted it. Maybe you should have thought about that before you said it. Maybe you should have thought about those things beforehand, which brings to light this very thing. Since we realize that we're a sower and every single day we're sowing, that means that we have some responsibility. If what we want to come back to us, we want to be in a positive nature. You see, Haggai reminds us of this. Haggai chapter number two and verse number 19. I just, just read the entire ch the, the book just the other day uh, in that instance. I read it very, very fast. Well, I didn't read it. It was read to me. I was listening. But uh, it reminds us, is the seed yet in the barn? Sometimes we don't want to sow good seed. We don't want to sow the things that we should. And we want to just leave it in the barn. But it's not accomplishing that task. That means if, if we leave the good seed in the barn, then that means that what we are sowing is something that's going to be of a negative nature. So that means that you and I need to make sure that every single day we think a little bit about what we're going to put our hand to the task, what we're going to do, how we react this morning. And uh, sorry about the personal illustration, but it was just a reminder even this morning. Uh, on Sunday, I usually have a routine that I go through. And uh, in the process of that routine, I recognize that something that I had purchased was not what I had purchased. Not that it, there was anything wrong with it. It just wasn't what I purchased. My immediate reaction was, I'm going to call. And then I stopped for a second. I thought, you know what? Maybe that person's having a bad day. Maybe this, is, this could be the last straw if I call and complain. And so instead of that, I said, Lord, today I did not get what I wanted. I did not get necessarily what I had paid for. But it could be that that individual is struggling today. And I don't want to be the problem that they've got to deal with. I'd rather be the solution. So, Lord, I don't know who they are. I have no idea what their name is. But, God, whatever circumstances that they're facing or whatever it is that they need today, if it, even if it's just distraction, God, help them to focus. Help them to be the person that they should be. Help me to have an opportunity to be a positive influence for them in some manner. See, I had a choice. I could call and complain and say, I paid for something and didn't get it. And they'd say, well, come back in. We'll make sure to take care of it. And then they would turn to the person possibly that said, you know, this is what happened. This is the last straw. You've been causing difficulties for the... I didn't want to be that individual. I had a choice. And so instead of taking the complaint to them, I took a petition to God. Now, I, not, not to say that uh, I, I am any... <laughs> citadel of spirituality, but sometimes you have to make a decision on what you're going to do. In that case, I want to make sure that there's going to be a positive. Guess what? I need a little bit of a break sometime too. I'm going to do something that I didn't intend. I'm going to do something because I was distracted. I'm going to do something at some point, and I need that grace to come back to me in some manner. And so in that instance, what you sow, you're going to reap. The, the parameters for sowing is this. You sow, you will reap. Reaping will be more than planted. Reaping will be more than planted. I guarantee it. Every single farmer that's in here, you don't, you don't plant one. When you go out to the field and you put your crops in the ground, you don't expect, well, did all that effort. I put in one, one seed of corn. I hope I get one seed back. No, they, they want an ear full of seeds, full of corn. So in that instance, reaping will be more than planted. So that means in your daily life, what you plant, what you sow, is going to come back in a larger degree than what you planted it. So what you're planting should make a difference. And then lastly, of course, reaping comes later than sowing. You can use that for the positive or you can use it for the negative. In that instance, I'm encouraging you for the positive. We've read through the verses here, but let me show you something, if I may, a familiar passage. But take your Bible and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Luke reminds us that a sower went out to sow. 
The purpose that he had in mind was he is going to sow seed. He is going to sow so that he can get the, the reaping, so that the crop will come. He knows that it won't come immediately, but he knows I've got to sow today so that tomorrow I can have hope of something to come. And in that instance, that means that you are sowing today in hopes of something that will come. Look, every single parent that's in here, you begin to invest in your children. You begin to invest in the positive things. The negative comes natural. That's a little sin nature that we're all born with. But the truth is, anything of a positive nature, you must teach. And you must uh, consistently do what is necessary so that they'll have those positive qualities. I, I know it's cute the first time they look at you and say, no. Because they've heard that a lot because you go, oh, no, 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 no. You may think it's cute when they look back at us and say, you know, you take something from them that they're not supposed to have, and you say, no, and they look at you and say, no, and you want to laugh. But you have to remember, if I laugh at their disobedience, they're going to think this is funny, and it turns into a game. Every single one of us at some point that have children, we've got that. You watch when the kids begin to play game. They're sitting in the high chair. As little as they are, and you're thinking how innocent they are, and you have rubbed their little head, and you've kissed their little brow, and you have, uh, you're feeding them, whether it's the airplane, brrr, or whatever the case may be, but the, they'll get something, and they push it off the edge, and it clangs, clang. So you pick it up, and you put it back up there, and they push it off again, clang, and you pick it up. Now it's become a game. Now they know, look at this. Every single time I push this off, Mama will pick it up. And, uh, and so uh, in that instance, <laughs> they learn those little things when you find a little bit of them and say, don't do that. And it's like, oh, that didn't get the response I was planning. This is not fun anymore. This is ugly. And so it's a, it's a learning process. By the way, your Heavenly Father is a good daddy. We do things once in a while and we think, huh, I got away with it. And then God looks at us and says, don't do that again. And it's like, oh, that did not please him. I must be careful about some of the things that I do. But at the same token, sometimes it's, uh, it's funny. Uh, Victoria's been teaching Annalyn some, just some sign language a little bit. And uh, thank you and more. And uh, More is this, isn't it? This is more. And uh, so if something is good, she'll, she'll go like this. And then, and then they go, yay. And so she starts, yay. And there is some reward to it. Once in a while, your heavenly father, you do something, and he says, yay. I enjoy, but the truth is in scripture it says, I rejoice to know that my children walk in truth. But I want you to notice if you would please, when we come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, notice if you would please in verse number 6, oops, turned one too many pages here, 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 6, scripture says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Notice the, the portion of the next verse. It says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So God says the seed that you're going to sow is going to be determined on the purpose that you have in mind. So you can either sow sparingly and then reap sparingly. I think it's kind of funny. We, uh, uh, a few weeks ago we were looking at the, uh, the event that uh, the Lord Jesus had told, uh, had, had told Peter, cast out into the deep. Cast your net, uh, cast your nets for a for a bounty of fish. And uh, now he was cleaning, repairing, and doing things. They were getting ready to close up for the day. He says, "Lord, we have we have toiled all night and we've caught nothing. Yet at thy word, I'll let down the net." Now Jesus said, "Let down your nets, plural." Peter said, "Okay, just to humor you, I'll let down my net." And he let the net down, and the Bible says that it began to fill with fish so much it was, it was causing the boats to sink. That's, that's a pretty good fishing day. So in that instance, all of a sudden, they had to remember, I doubt it. You know, but the Lord is still in charge of everything that goes on. When you sow sparingly, depending upon what it is, you may just reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you can sow bountifully. I've got three things I want to mention to you this morning specifically. For you and I in this new year, realizing that you and I are going to be the sowers and the seed that we're sowing is going to make a difference and an impact on ourselves, our family, and our world, that means that we must determine what we're going to do. So number one, determine you will sow. Determine you will sow. 
So that means the purpose behind it is I'm not just going to happenstance all my entire life. I'm not going to live by circumstance. I'm not going to live by uh, when something comes my way, I'm going to react to it. Instead of being a reactor, why don't you be an actor? In other words, don't wait for something to come your way, but why don't you put something into practice? I, I never understood it for the longest time. My grandma would say, uh, when I would, I'd make a comment like, well, I wish I had this, or I wish I could do that, or wish, and my grandma would say, son, She'd say, spit in one hand and wish in the other and see which one fills up faster. And I used to look at her and think, what in the world are you talking about? You know, I, it wasn't until college and I was sitting there contemplating that all of a sudden it hit me. Bam. Oh. I can either make something happen or wish it would happen. It's like, it, okay, you see how, see how I need a, a name like Maverick so I can pick up on things a little faster? Unfortunately, it's like, oh, look at that. Either you can make something happen or you can constantly be wishing something would happen. And you as a child of God have the ability to go to the throne room of grace and say, God, what positive things, what seed can I sow that's going to be of a positive nature to bring an impact that's going to benefit me, benefit my family, benefit my community, benefit those around me. And the Bible reminds us over and over in Scripture, Joseph was the one that even though he did not live in his hometown, he did not live with his family, the next thing you know, Pharaoh is benefiting because of him. And he is now second in command of everybody until his brothers are come to him and say, uh, and not even knowing that it was him. And Joseph is sitting on the, the throne of Egypt of the time. And uh, not that he is ruling, if I can put it like that. Pharaoh was still number one, but he was in charge of everything else. And everybody came to them because he knew what was going on. He had already sown, and now he was reaping. Over and over again, we see that very same thing take place in the life of people that determine, I'm going to sow, but what I'm going to sow is going to be something of a positive nature. Since I am sowing, I'm not going to sow those things of discord. I'm not going to sow those things of criticism. I'm not going to sow those things of sarcasm. I'm not going to post those things on Facebook. Oh, 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 oh. Don't get on that soapbox, Pastor. You see, you manage to get up on that thing quite often, don't you? Yes, because I think there's way too much negative that we take in. And if you take in so much negative, guess what you're going to push out? So when you start taking in the positive things, you say, well, I know, but there's so many things. On okay, here's my solution. Not a single one of you are going to like it. Stop reading it. See how it sucked the air right out of here? It's like, Pastor, don't you know that is Facebook? They rule the world. No, God rules the world. You need to get off Facebook and get your face in the book. Ain't that right, Brother Gerber? That's the way it works. And so in that instance, you'd have a whole lot better reaction to what goes on. And so believe me, there's, I know that you say there's plenty of positive on there. And I think that if you're going to post something, it should be positive. You're going to get negative response. <laughs> if I post something, I'm never going to read a comment. Never. Never. Whether it's good or bad, I'm just not going to read it. Reason being is I didn't put it there for, to get a comment necessarily. I put it there for information. Not just inflammation, information. In that instance, that means sometimes you're going to have to determine if I'm sowing something, it's going to be of a positive nature. Now, are you oftentimes going to get, there is always somebody that's looking for the negative. Always somebody that's quick. You could put on there, Jesus saves, and somebody was going to put on there, you didn't quote that right. You know there's going to be somebody that does something like that. You're going to look at somebody and you're going to say, have a good day, and they're going to look at you and say, what do you mean by that? You didn't say it yesterday. Why today? What's the difference? And immediately your pride's going to say, because I didn't like you yesterday. I'm making myself do it today. But the truth is, once in a while, you're going to have to make sure that there's going to be, there's going to be somebody to do that. I hope you're not that person. But determine you will sow. That means that you will be, by the way, you're going to be sowing anyway. Why not determine you're going to do it for a positive nature? You're going to be sowing every single day. You're going to be sowing something, whether you or I like it or not. There is a law of sowing and reaping. You're going to be putting out things that are going to come back to you every single day. So just determine those things that I'm putting out, those things that I'm going to administer, those things that are coming from me are going to be those things that bring salt and light to my world. You know, it's, it's a very simple song, but it goes, brighten the corner where you are, brighten the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor, you may guide across the bar, brighten the corner where you are. Just keep those things in mind. See, I can either be the problem that somebody's got to deal with, or I can be the solution that folks are looking for. So be uh, just be conscious that you are sowing. 
Be conscious that you are sowing. Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 5, the verse that we looked at immediately reminds us that a sower went out to sow. You are going to be sowing something. Since you are going to be sowing, that leads me to the very next thing, determined to sow good seed. Determined to sow good seed. Scripture reminds us that since that sower went out to sow, uh, then that means some is going to fall on ground. You're not going to be able to do, uh, uh, let, let me, you're not going to be able to determine how folks react to your positive nature. You're not going to be able to uh, understand completely everything that comes back at you sometimes. But it doesn't mean you have to act negatively to overcome those things. You just continue. I jotted it like this, be the solution. Stop with the, it, look, if we'll come to a point where we just stop the excuses of this, I can't fix everything, well, no kidding. We know you can't fix everything, but I know who can. So if you determine the reason why I'm sowing, the reason why I'm trying to be positive, the reason why I'm sowing good seed is because I'm trying to take he who can solve every single problem, he who can deal with everything that needs to be done, and interjecting him into every portion of my life and whatsoever it can be done. It doesn't matter what it is. Just stop with the excuse. I can't fix it. Okay, nobody, nobody put it in Scripture that you're to solve every single problem. But you can pray about everything. You can, do a, you can do what you can to try to be a positive influence in that manner. This new year needs to be this. There's been enough negative in the previous year to, to serve us a good couple lifetimes. But in that instance, that means that this year needs to be the year that you put it on a positive note and be the solution instead of a portion of the problem. Yes, we all know there's difficulties here. Yes, we all know the difficulties that come in, uh, in, in government and politics and things of that nature. We all know about those things. We all have a, 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 a percentage of our life that we don't trust what they say and what they do. But in that instance, you can still trust what God says, and he says you need to be a sower that's going to be sowing good seed. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn back a few pages to Matthew. Matthew chapter number 13, just for a moment. Matthew chapter number 13, the first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 13. And look, if you would, please, in verse number 27. Matthew chapter number 13 and verse number 27. The Bible reminds us of this. He says, So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? So the question comes, there is the question that can be, what am I going to sow? Am I going to sow good seed? Am I going to be the solution? <laughs> Somebody said one time, look, you are an American, not an American. You can do what needs to be done. So in that instance, determined to sow good seed. That means I'm going to be positive in every single aspect that I can. I'm going to try to do what I can to be the person that's going to be the solution, not the problem. I want folks to look forward to me showing up, not think, oh no, they're here. And so in that instance, just determined to sow good seed. Because you have the opportunity, you have the ability, it's in your decisive determination and nature to choose which one you're going to. I'll tell you right now, the first thing you want to do is run to criticism because it's way too easy. And, we've, and, we, and, and instead of vilifying those things uh, that we should not, we oftentimes embrace it and say, oh, boy, it's so easy because it, it services our pride. I'll teach them a lesson. Well, how about we let Jesus teach the lesson and we try to be positive? You say, I, well, I know, but we live in such a negative world. I know be the solution. It's not always easy. You say, well, sometimes it costs. I know it does. Look, there are people in this congregation right here have been punished for doing right. Guess what? It'll happen again, too. I'm sorry for it, but it's the nature. The only way that you overcome evil is you overcome it with good. You continue to do right. But that leads me to the very last thing. Number one, I said, determine you will sow. Number two, determine to sow good seed. And then lastly, number three, sow enough to overcome. So enough to overcome. Let me give you some ideas here if I may. Pray for instead of criticize. Pray for instead of criticize. Believe me, it's easy to go to that critical nature. It is very easy. And sometimes when you're quick-witted, it's easy to come up with a sarcastic uh, rebuttal or response. But sometimes it takes a little more effort to be somebody uh, just the other day. They may say to you, Boy, you're, you're a sorry individual. You say, you know what? You're not the only one that said that. 
You don't have to take it and say, no, I'm not. Just agree and say, you know what? You're probably right for the first time in your life. But, uh, you know, see how easy it is? But the truth is, pray for instead of criticize. Pray for instead of criticize. You can say, Lord, you know what I'm made out of. And I sure am not made of much, but I sure want to be a help and a blessing to those that are around me, even whether they deserve it or not. Because the truth is, none of us deserve a great deal. But God has extended grace to us instead. Pray for instead of criticize. Next, be a friend to somebody new. This year, just determine, I'm going to be a friend to somebody new. Now, I, I've, I've got friends, but I'm going to find somebody, and I'm going to be a friend to them this year. Just determine that you will be a friend to somebody this year, some new person this year, and you are a friend to them. That means that you find out when their birthday is and you send them a card or a note and let them know, hey, I was thinking about you. Just be a friend to someone new this year. Find who it is. You know, let me tell you this. You know the saddest thing when I was in college is the, the girls that were the sharpest and the prettiest and the most put together, nobody asked on a date. You want to know why? They were scared of them. I was just stupid enough to not care. If you don't, if you don't think for a second, you know I married up. I know I have. When I saw her singing in chapel that one day and I thought, I don't know who that is, but I'm going to find out. I've told you before, I already had a list. I had determined. I had looked around and I saw a bunch of homely looking fellas with some very pretty wives are pretty girlfriends, and I thought, wow, if they've got a chance, I've got a chance. I look at me in the mirror, and I see how scrappy I am. My lands, you know, I don't know what it is. And so I just made a list, and I started going down the list, and if, if everything went well, I might ask again. Now, a date for us in Bible college was we'd go and sit in, in chapel together, and we'd talk, or we'd go eat lunch in the, uh, in the, uh, in the cafeteria together and talk and things, or, or just sit in the, uh, the little restaurant and, and, and drink a soda or something and, and just converse. It wasn't, it wasn't running around and things of that nature. It was something very simple. Uh, but uh, at that point, there finally came a point where that little blonde-haired beauty was singing in chapel. And I asked the person that saved me a seat, and she gets mad about this. The old gal was Lisa, and, uh, and I didn't, she saved me a seat because her class was in there. But I didn't like her in the least bit. She says, oh, she liked you. I didn't like her or didn't. She saved my seat. That was what I, and uh, it, it, now we were friends. We worked on the same bus route and things of that nature, but I, I, I had no interest in that manner. And, uh, but I asked her, I said, who is that? She goes, I don't know. I said, well, find out who she is. She worked on security, so I said, well, find out. So she got a name. So I determined that, like I said, <laughs> I was already going down my list. If they said nope, it's like, okay, go to the next. You say, well, didn't it hurt your self-esteem? I was too stupid to know I needed self-esteem. <laughs> I just didn't care. But the one day I, was, uh, I, I found out what her name was, and that day I happened to be wearing one of the nicer suits that I had, and I said, well, I better ask her today, or I may not, uh, I may not look this good tomorrow. And so uh, I, I went up to the, uh, the information desk. There wasn't a lot of information, there, but it was a desk anyway. Uh, but the, the gal that worked behind it happened to work on my bus route, and, uh, and I asked her. She worked on security, and I said, uh, Miss Vicki, I said, would you call up and find out if, if Marlene Lomax is in her room? And she goes, well, what am I supposed to say? I said, well, you're on security. I don't care. Ask her if she's got a car on campus. Oh, okay. So she calls up there. And uh, she says, no, she doesn't have a car on campus. I said, okay. I just needed to know that she was there. And uh, I said, ask her if she'd be willing to meet somebody down at the post office at, it was either, you know, 1.30, 2 o'clock, something like that, because I was going to have to go to work uh, in just a little bit. And so she goes, Okay. So she calls up there and, and asks her if she'd be willing to meet somebody down in the hallway there at the post office uh, at such and such a time. So uh, I, I was, happened to be walking with one of the young men that worked on my bus route at the time, and uh, Andre, so we walked, and I was waiting to see if, if she came down, because if she didn't come down there, eh, sorry about it. But the Lord was in it, and he had her come down and, and sit there on the, the little bench across from the post office. But she came down with her roommate. And all these things are transpiring, and somebody calls and asks, would you come down and, and meet somebody at the post office? Would you do all these things? And so uh, I, and I was walking with Andre right there. We walked right, walked right past them because I wanted to make sure they were down there. <laughs> 
And so I walked a little further, and I told Andre, I said, well, I'm going to go back and introduce myself to this, this uh, girl that came down, so I'll, I'll see you later. So I turned around and went back. And I introduced myself and uh, invited her to skit night there uh, at the college. And uh, in that instance, and from that is just history. But the interesting thing about all that transpired on April the 1st, April Fool's Day. Yeah, somebody could have been pulling a big joke on that one. And so, but, uh, <laughs> but we just looked at it like, oh, that's the way it works. Look, sow decent seed. Be a friend to somebody new. Next, praise instead of complain and post. Praise instead of complain and post. Look, you're going to have things that are going to happen in your life. Don't tell the whole world. They don't need to see your dirty laundry. They don't. And, uh, and I know it's a good way to vent, but that's why Jesus has a, a, a closet for you to go into and vent to him. So take it to him. Take your burden to the cross and leave it there. Everybody, and I know it's fun. It's like, well, I want to I gather a crowd so they'll be on my side. You don't need that because you and the Lord will make a majority. Take it to him. It'll, it'll accomplish a great deal more, I promise. But praise instead of complain and post. Because when some, look, I guarantee you, every single person in this auditorium this morning, you're going to have something happen to you in this new year that you're going to have a reason to tell somebody, I don't like this. I don't appreciate this. I've been done wrong. That's going to happen to you. I'm telling you right now, it's going to happen. Young people in school, it's going to be unfair. It's going to be unjust. Somebody's going to treat you unkindly. You're going to get picked last for dodgeball. Do they still play dodgeball? Are we allowed to play dodgeball? Man, I look forward to that. I really did. And, uh, but in that instance, you're going to get picked last. You're not going to be the, the first chair to play uh, whatever instrument you play in, in the school band. You're going to end up having to play the tuba instead of the saxophone. You're going to end up having to play the, the, one of the other instruments that nobody wants to play. I don't even know what it is that it, no one wants to play. Does anybody know what instrument does really no one want to play and you got thrown under the bus? because you The piccolo. Nobody <laughs> wanted to play the piccolo. It's going to happen. It's going to. But the truth is... Instead of saying, I didn't choose this, say, Lord, I'm grateful that I have air. I'm, I'm grateful that I'm at least able to, to move, to think, to sing, to whatever the case may be. But just praise instead of complaining and posting. Next, compliment too much every week. Compliment somebody sometime, at some point, too much every week. You can find somebody, something positive about somebody. Even it's like, man, you wreck things better than anybody else I've ever seen. You, good job. Compliment too much in a week. Just compliment too much. Look, you may walk in there and you may look at your husband and think, oh, my lands, what in the world? But say, you know what? You have consistently been everywhere all the time. You can compliment somebody at some point. Because, believe me, every last one of us have gotten furniture disease. Our, our, our chest has gone down to our drawers. You know, we, we know that, that it just happens. The hair begins to thin and what don't turn gray turns loose. We know some of those things. We're not everything we used to be. But the truth is, you can say, you know what? Man, he goes to work. Man, he, whatever the case may be, you can compliment in some manner. I know it won't be easy. But I'm talking about sowing good seed. I'm talking about sowing the things that are going to be a positive. You want those things to come back to you. Have you ever wondered why there may be a deficit now? What have you been sowing? You say, well, I, I, you know, nobody treats me nice. I wonder why. He that, has, he that wants to be a friend or needs a friend must show himself friendly. Compliment too much every single week. And then here's one that all of us need to practice probably a little bit more, and this one's difficult for me. Use the expression, I love you. That's one of them that I didn't grow up hearing a great deal, although I knew it. Probably until I was in college did I hear my dad tell me, I love you, son. Now, he did, but I just never remember hearing it. Tell my brother that? Never. Never. But just the other day, I was talking to him on the phone, and I said, I love you, Doug. He said, I love you too, brother. And it breaks my heart to think that it took so many years before I'd be willing to do something like that. My older sister called me early one just this week, and she said, Bubby, how's it going? 
And as we talked for a little bit, she said, I love you, bub. I said, sis, I love you too. Why is it so difficult for us to use that? This morning, I told over 10 people, I love you. You and I need to practice that a great deal more. Let me put it like this. There is enough hate in this world to go around. It is expressed over and over. We have seen enough hate. And if you watch some of the news, you see it vehemently. Maybe it's time for you and I that know true love, how to explain it, express it, and we should. Use the expression, I love you. It's not evil. Matter of fact, there's, Scripture says there's no law against telling somebody that you care for them. There are laws against hate. And you and I need to make sure that we overcompensate on the hate thing. In other words, we need to make sure that we have a whole lot more love to share. You say, well, I don't feel like it. I know. Do it anyway. You're sowing good seed. You say, well, I, I, I don't feel. I'm not asking you about feelings. I'm asking you about decisions. Sower went out to sow. He didn't feel like it. He did it. Sower went out to sow. It's not because it was just the only thing he had to do. It's because he did it on purpose. The Bible reminds us that seeds need to be sown. And you and I need to make sure that we're sowing the good seed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again for the gracious kindness and, Lord, the greatest, uh, the greatest message and the greatest seed that could ever be planted is the gospel. God, thank you so much that we can know for sure that we're on our way to heaven. And Father, I do ask that you'd please just help us now to follow the tenets that you've given to us. The principles that are there and that truth is practical. It needs to be emphasized. It needs to be expressed. It needs to be expounded upon in our world today. I ask that you'd please just help us. Thank you again for all that you do. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just meet the needs today. In just a second, we're going to stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. The question this morning is this. Will you brighten that corner where you are? Will you be the solution that this world needs? Will you make every place a little bit better because you were there? Or will you just go on with status quo? Say, well, I'm, I can't stop all the hate. I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you to involve the seeds of love and positive and a good nature. Because you and I can't, we cannot fix everything. We know that. Quit using it as an excuse. Let's go to him who that can. In that instance, God has made it available and a reminder that we have a brand new year. What are you going to sow in it this year? Will you sow the seeds of kindness, solution, positive? Or will you continue to allow the criticisms, complaints, sometimes even hate to be sown? It's up to you. The determining factor is determine what you're going to sow. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. As the instruments begin to play, if God's spoken to your heart this morning, the altar's open, you may come. <laughs>